received that call from Afghanistan. Picked up the call. He was the director of the federation telling me, yo, Victor, Taliban came to the power. We received death threat letters. We're risking our life for being snowboarders and for supporting men and women equity. Man, you wanted to come to Afghanistan. It won't be possible, but please help us. Hello, everyone. What's going on? My name is Nils Mindnick, and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed at providing insight into the outdoor industry by interviewing people who operate within it. Today, I'm going to be talking with my good buddy, Victor Davier. Victor is a lifelong snowboarder from France who, like many of us, started out in contests and has transitioned into the backcountry. His passion for snowboarding is undeniable and it's brought him all over the world. Outside of being a professional snowboarder, Victor is a small business owner, avalanche educator, and also found himself in the humanitarian space when he helped Afghanistan snowboarders seek asylum. I cannot wait to dive into today's conversation. I've known Victor for a while. It's going to be a fun one. Bro, what up? Yo, stoked to be here. <laughs> Thanks for that beautiful intro. Yeah, man, of course. E you know, hey, easy to put up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I figured we could start out by maybe touching base on what you're doing in Utah right now and what our previous week just looked like. Because yeah. you're a long way from home. What, how'd you end up here? Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, we just made it to Utah last night. And right before that, we were in Colorado, Colorado, yeah, <laughs> uh, for our duo with Natural Selection, my first uh, Natural Selection participation. And uh, we had a full week there. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we were scoping there without my bags because they haven't showed up. So thank you once again for the board. You borrowed me um, at borrow. So thank you so much. And then, yeah, snow started to show up. We had some great pow, great pow session. And yeah, we made that duel happen and it was a good one, good session with you. I will remember that one. Yeah, great week and with the natural selection, that was amazing. So yeah, and a uh, shout out to all the locals from the Purgatory. They, are, they have a crazy community there. Yeah, seriously. I know it sounded like uh, Mark listens to the show and he was psyched on it so give it give a nice shout out to mark yeah shout out mark's mark. park i mean there's to we maybe to, add some context yeah. like yeah. so mark is the the hot local there and he built i don't know 132 more, wooden rail in the resort so you would have like sneaky way through the forest where you could do like jib many many like wooden spots which is awesome, and he's such a rad uh, human and so passionate about snowboarding. So it was uh, it was cool to meet Mark in person. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for the experience. We'll remember that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and yeah, again, the whole the whole local crowd. I don't think either of us had encountered such like a strong community like that. It was quite refreshing. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, it was really cool to see. And what a week! Mm -hmm. Even had to watch my first uh, Super Bowl. Game, yeah ever ever so that was cool too great experience <laughs> for you guys yeah we had a good uh super bowl showing actually um poor victor he kept asking me for just like pointers or like he was curious about how the, the game worked and um i don't watch football i have no clue how <laughs> football works so this poor guy is trying to like inquire with me about points and what the lines mean and all that stuff and i just kept having to give him the i i have no idea man i'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> no worries it was fun and then uh, we should conclude with our incredible hike in moab last, yesterday yeah dude on the way back we did a little little pit stop you're kind of getting the you know the tour de west coast really we're getting yeah. a nice southwest colorado we get some pow and then had to uh introduce you to moab which was sick did a little that was incredible nice little hike through devil's kitchen i think was what it was exactly, called in arches yeah. national park it was nice yeah, good times, good mm -hmm. times. Totally. I'm kind of curious, and we've actually never really even chatted about this, but you you have, you have a lot going on, you know? I feel like a lot of, especially 
it's very common that pro snowboarders or even anyone, they sort of find their lane, whether it's at the office doing marketing or you're a snowboarder and you smoke is focus on snowboarding and posting videos, but you know, you have nonprofits that you're involved in, you have educational courses you're involved in, you have, you know, a, you know, you're an entrepreneur with a business, you're still a pro snowboarder. You also have a master's degree in business marketing, right? Exactly. Yeah. For me, that sounds exhausting for you. Why <laughs> you've done like it seems like you're doing so much. Where does that where yeah. does that motivation come from? I think first of all, I love snowboarding and that's my main thing. You know, I'm so passionate. I've been snowboarding for twenty six years at least. And still, you know, when the snow comes, I'm so excited and that's my priority. And then I get passionate about things super easily. And um uh, yeah. When I have something in my eye, I just want to, yeah, make it happen. And I don't have the feeling that it's a, it's some work because I do it with passion. And I ended up with a, a big list. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so when I commit uh, on, on some stuff, I go for it. And, and uh, yeah, some great thing happened. Sometimes it was, it was a little bit too much. But now looking back at it, uh, I'm pretty proud of some of the project I I made it happen. Yeah, dude, for sure. I mean, it's it's been really cool to see. And again, I mean, there's probably a really good uh, feedback loop, like a positive feedback loop I bet you get after you kind of accomplish one, at least for me, if I set out at something, even if it's something as simple as putting an edit together, yeah. but you haven't done it before, and then you figure it out, you struggle, then you accomplish it. Yeah. It kind of gives you this like, confidence but also a pretty good uh almost like a dopamine hit yeah <clears throat> yeah for sure maybe similar to snowboarding in a way of like trying to learn a trick yeah mm -hmm. so yeah i've been uh, doing a lot recently and i'm trying to slow down a little bit but yeah i've been uh, snowboarding full on uh, it's cool in the back country uh kind of like transitioning from um, uh shooting for video for video parts to my own projects with triple Ed. We have to mention that Niels was the guest number two in my triplet uh, web series. Yeah. We went to Greece riding horses. Uh, <laughs> Still the funnest trip I've ever gone on. <laughs> it was insane. Guys, it was insane. What is, yeah, I guess a little bit, and we're going to bounce around somewhat, but at, at a certain point you went contest to backcountry, and even within backcountry you kind of followed the traditional production route. Exactly. And yeah. then transitioned into what is sort of necessary now and that's self-produced yeah um trips how did i guess if we just want to back up from the start for sure what was your kind of contest bring up like so first of all i grew up in the south of the french alps where you know the snowboard scene was super small people were hyped on snowboarding we know we're in a small snowboard club with my brother started in that tiny resort called Réalon that I'm sure you never heard of. And um, yeah, just a pretty simple start, I would say. Like, we're just friends going snowboarding on Sundays. And um, yeah, so it started really slowly, pretty far from competing. Just, it was the snowboard vibe. People were going there to snowboard, improve, have fun with friends. So I started pretty late compared to my friends like uh, Victor Delarue, Arthur Longo, Valerian de Courtil, Thomas Delfino. We were more in like <clears throat> in bigger snowboard clubs and getting more lights and getting their first sponsors earlier. I Me, mean, I was pretty, pretty back from that. So uh, yeah, I started really late competing and, but uh, yeah, the, the coaches realized we had a quite good level. So yeah, we started competing and straight away we got our first results and uh, ended up a French champion, a five French champion, quite young. No and way, what yeah. age? Uh, 15. 15, In okay. my category though. Yeah, totally. So that's your version of, I think ours is nationals or something like yeah. that. Okay, cool. So following that, uh, I had the opportunity to join a, a sport high school program for winter winter sportsman so mm -hmm. it was a really radio opportunity where we wouldn't have school during the winter pretty much 
So, and that was the start where I was starting to compete more, meet more friends that were in the same vibe as I do, which are still my friends, you know, like uh, Arthur Longo, Victor okay. Delaru, yeah. Thomas Delfino, uh, Valerian Ducourtil, we all grew up in the same, in the same vibe, uh, pretty much around the same school systems. And, um, and that's how I got to competitions. Then I started to compete in a little bit less in half pipe, more in slope style, bigger. Did a few European Cups, World Cups, one X game participation, Euro X game participation. You did the X Games? Yeah, man. No way, what year? Uh, 2009, I think. Sick. Yeah. That's so dumb. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> that was really cool. So yeah, got to compete a little bit, but I, I kind of like realized at some point that uh, I was just following the mood, you know, going from a TTR contest to another, and wasn't, I wasn't down to compete compete against my friend on ice, you know. At some point, I realized like that, why am I doing this, you know? At that time, um, some sponsors came out with some uh, shooting opportunities for different productions or commercial movies. And, um, yeah, that's how we ended up in the backcountry and straight away I found my path. You know, I was like, wow, we're in the mountains with friends, pushing ourselves, not competing against each other, but pushing ourselves in the backcountry. And that's my vision of snowboarding and what I truly like, you know, that must have been like a real kind of homecoming in a way. <clears throat> Did it, like, it had was, you been outdoorsy it, before? Like, were you a hiker in the summer as a child or yeah, anything like that? I've been always super a super big fan you know of uh, nature either in the winter or in the summer you know hiking and stuff protecting nature too you know uh, i remember i would like kick adults uh, ass if they would cut a tree for christmas or something i would be, get so mad i would like <laughs> no you can't cut trees man Fun police that's yeah. the that's the nature you can't do that a like, little regulating croissant yeah <laughs> exactly so i always love that and um our club was on Saturday, and uh, we didn't have really good parks where we grew up, so we would build kickers on Sundays. Hmm. You know, my mother would drive us to the resort, and we would shape our own backcountry spots with the oldest from the club, who had a bit more experience than, uh, <clears throat> than I did. And from that, uh, yeah, I kind of like always got into the backcountry vibe a little bit, because cool. we didn't have a park at the beginning. Yeah. No so uh, that's pretty much how when I found back backcountry when we had those first shooting opportunities, we were like, yeah, I've been doing that and I always loved that. So it came out like quite naturally. Hmm. Yeah. No way. And it just kind of kept compounding from there. I mean, it seemed like things must have took off really quickly because yeah. I remember <clears throat> when we first met, I believe it was the summer of 2015 around then or maybe 2014 Mount Hood. at Mount Hood and yeah. you were uh you were interning for college yeah. with Solomon which uh maybe wasn't the most intense internship and I I yeah. never knew who you were but like you had already I think you had just filmed like an ender for Almo films right yeah which, Almo which at the films. time was quite that was like the pinnacle of the European like production scene correct yeah, kind of um yeah, so I had different opportunities. We started with uh, Harakiri, um, mm -hmm. a French production where we shot for three years. At the same time, we were shooting with Rip Curl back in the days with uh, Victor Delarue for their promo movies. And uh, yeah, they put, uh, they put some pretty big bets on us. Yeah. And um, we ended up yeah, shooting some great video parts, hanging, hanging in the mountains, pushing ourselves pretty pretty hardly, you know, at yeah. quite a young age. And following that, <clears throat> Amo film started. So same, it was like some big opportunities from the eldest. And from Amo film, shot for Absinthe. And that's the summer I, I guess we met each other because I remember we edited a little bit uh, with Absinthe there at Mount Hood. And then, uh, yeah, transitioned to Transfold for three years. That sick. was a really sick too. Yeah. Well, this is actually kind of interesting how this is shaping up because, you know, where it sort of went next is you start doing your own projects, right, with Trip Roulette. And it seems like that really maybe even tapped more into this 
adventure yeah. side that you're pretty psyched on. R- real quick, you'd mentioned like you and Victor De La Rue rip curl. You told me recently, just <laughs> just was a crazy story, I guess, about like swimming in a volcano or something like yeah. that. Dude, <laughs> just r- real quick, run us through that one of maybe an early film yeah. trip. <laughs> <clears throat> no, first of all, I've always been really curious, you know, and uh, at the same time as uh, filming video parts, we've been organizing like kind of like exotic snowboard trips. So with Almo, we've been to Kazakhstan. Uh, with Rupkio, we've been to Argentina, and I will tell that story later. With Transport, we've been to Israel. With um, Neil Shack, we've been to Turkey. Um, I've been to Pakistan. Like I've always been down to find some like fun destination, and that ex- the excuse is no word. I've been really lucky to make all those trips happen. And then, yeah, 2009, first trip to Argentina uh, with uh, my good buddy Victor De La Rue. Ripio sent us there for a month, and you know, it, it was like, we we're like uh, stupid teenagers, you know. We shaved our head here, so we had long hair, <laughs> we shaved our head. <laughs> that was so funny, and we are yeah, partying uh, a lot at that time. And yeah, um, during those shooting days, we ended up uh, in Cabiawe, amazing spot between Argentina and Chile. Hiked a volcano, arrived at the top of the volcano with our snowboards, and we're like, wow, there's a lake in the middle of the crater. That's cool. But the lake was pretty deep. Maybe you will do the conversion. The, sure, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, 300 meters down below. Okay, it's like almost 1,000 feet. 1,000 feet below. So we had to hike down to that lake. And it was pretty sketchy, you know, some rocks were falling from the top all the time. It was like some pretty scrambly rocks, but then we were motivated to go and swim in that crazy volcano. And we ended up uh, swimming in that one in a really milky and pretty hot water, I remember. (laughs) But especially such a smelly water. The (laughs) suffer was like so strong. And uh, yeah, those boxers have been smelling forever since. Then we hiked back up. Um, from the the lake to the top of the volcano and then at a uh, backcountry station late afternoon and I remember stomping a backside five melon first try I was like wow what without boxers because my boxers <laughs> were wet and I was like it's pretty crazy and that's souvenir. the secret man hot no, hot springs suffer is the solution yeah the volcano is uh, super safe too for a long time <laughs> Yeah, and uh, a couple of years after the volcano exploded, I forgot to mention that <laughs> <laughs> eruption and everything exploded. Again, uh, you know, I'm going to drive this one in another direction. Speaking of explosions, I-, I really want you to also share your snow safety story from uh, was it Kazakhstan. Yeah. Exactly, because it's sort of still in the film era, like an adventure yeah. trip slash yeah, exactly. like production so trip. I mentioned before with Almo, we've been to uh, Kazakhstan once for jibbing and backcountry trip. We kind of like knew the owner because he was French, and um, got there because yeah, I've been riding a little bit of a jib before. Okay, okay. Before I realized it wasn't my thing, but I've always been inspired by jibbing. And uh, yeah, we were uh, in that resort and you just know the food. And the owner was like, I mean, the manager was saying like, yo, you should go and watch uh, how the guys are um, making sure that the resort is safe, avalanche wise Because there weren't really pros in that resort because they didn't want any explosives in the resort because the president uh, would have a house in the resort and wouldn't be down with dynamites or any explosives. So they would call the firework crew from town, like a town one hour away. <laughs> Five guys would show up wearing jeans, st- street shoes, in the backcountry with one plastic pipe, would take some fireworks, light them up, put them in the pipe, target where they want to shoot 
and then randomly try to snipe the right spot. So sometimes he would explode in front of them, sometimes he would go behind the mountain, <laughs> and uh, it was insane to to see him, see how loose they were, and it was like crazy compared to Europe where it's very dark, pretty strict, yeah, yeah, or like I guess guy. it's the same in, in <laughs> Canada or in the US, you know, it's just like totally different. And uh, so they didn't start any avalanches with those uh, fireworks, obviously. But after five tries, they were getting confident. And uh, I don't know if you will be able to show the videos, maybe share a link with the... Yeah, you can share a link, or, or you can listeners. just look up like avalanche control Kazakhstan style, is what it's called, Yeah, as to what, what happens next. And then, uh, yeah, so they were pretty confident. Slope was like that. Set it up their pipe with their fireworks, light, lighting it up, shot, firework in the middle of the slope. And we could see like a tiny avalanche started and like the guys were stoked. Yeah, we finally started uh, something. Something is moving. Got pretty hyped about it. And then the guys realized that they sent that bomb and they were right below the yeah, avalanche. Yeah, they just they shot started. a face directly yeah. above that. <laughs> and suddenly they starting hiking up that pole that was right behind them, that uh, Charlie's pole. And the five guys are behind each other trying to run at that pole. It was just... crazy. The video's insane. You know, and how, you, how it was shot, is it just like it's a handy cam on someone's old cell phone and you see this firework shoot up the slope and then you don't even know that it's a firework, but then it explodes <laughs> and there's like the sparks of it. And you're like, what is going on? And then it looks like it's going to be a small little like slough break and then all of a sudden the whole slope starts to release and i think it was yeah. probably like a definitely big enough to bury a car like for sure. bury like a larger car maybe and a semi truck or they something their snowmobile and they there. completely buried their snowmobile so then the, the video of this avalanche starting uh you guys like pan down and yeah there's just five avalanche control dudes run uh, scurrying up a, a lift tower and it's just the most Without your context as well, it seems like the craziest, loosest thing. Ever. That was insane. And I see that was insane. Yeah. And then, um, so that probably was that around the same time you started Safety Shred Days, or how did no, that, that come about? That was really early compared to the Safety Shred Days. Yeah. Um, because that's also I think maybe a cool direction to go with this. We can yeah. keep bouncing around, but so that day, as we. We saw, you know, it was really touchy, uh, avalanche ways. And that was a really fun moment. But 20 minutes after, two ski patrols came to us saying like, yo, you're the pro riders. Uh, a huge avalanche happened at the, in the back of that mountain. You should go check it out. Please help us. What? Okay. I'm 20 years old at uh, that time. So show up with my transceiver on the avalanche with two of my friends. The ski patrols couldn't follow us because they didn't know how to ski off beast. And we're the first one on the that huge avalanche. We know that somebody was buried and uh, we were searching all day. The, the army showed up a couple hours later and uh, he didn't have any transceiver so we couldn't find him and the avalanche was massive. And uh, yeah, that was my first real negative experience with avalanches, and I guess that was the starting point of uh, what led me to create the Safety Shred Days and avalanche safety uh, events, where we train for, uh, for risk management and uh, avalanche rescue trainings. And, uh, but yeah, I was 20 years old, and um, then I was also on the avalanche when, uh, in 2016, in Ains, Alaska, when uh, Buddy Merrill, who was sharing the same alley with us, got buried in an avalanche. Oh, and Hans was there uh, yeah. for that, yeah. Exactly, and had to rescue with uh, your brother. And I think that's where I really realized that um, we, were, we needed to be more trained and uh, more aware about avalanches. Because on that day, Buddy Merrill didn't do any mistake, like any big mistake, you know. And uh, he ended up being buried under a really big layer of snow, like probably like 1.5, 2 meters. And we were like 10 snowboarder trained on that day. Maybe eight snowboarders, two guides, one Ellie already there. And uh, it was tight, you know. Uh, um, 
we got him out. Uh, I saw him like pretty much, you know, unconscious. And um, that was like a pretty shocking moment where I realized, whoa, we're in the best scenario as possible. We were trained, we had guides, we had an alley, we didn't do that many mistakes. But thinking about it, like all my friends in my home resort, they're loose as fuck. And if an avalanche like that one happen, and if they don't have the gear or if they're not trained, we're going to lose some friends in our community. And that's where I realized, okay, Victor, you should move your ass and make something happen. Yeah. So two years after, it was the first Safety Shred Days edition. And the goal was to <clears throat> gather some money from sponsors and create our event where it would be, yeah, beginning of the season gathering, um, avalanche um, rescue trainings for the young generation with cheap prices and cool spirits. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure, I mean, that's almost, you said 11 years ago now? No, so, no, 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 no. That, would, that would be like six or seven We've years. been doing 12 edition yet. Okay, okay, so, 12 editions. But um, we started seven years ago mm -hmm. already. How's that journey been? And it was. Um, you feel like it's a well-oiled machine, or are you kind of like to take a while to figure out? Because I feel so, I've, so, I've thought of trying to, and I think a group did something similar, like a snowboard homies crew did a self-produced avalanche training in Utah this year. Yeah. And there's been one that we all go, a lot of us go to up in Canada. And thinking about yeah, like the logistics and the moving parts and all of yeah. that, it seems like it would t be kind of overwhelming. Yeah, definitely. Just just to let you know, I'm like volunteering for those events. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to get any money. I do that for the community. And and yeah, at the beginning I started, I, I didn't want it to be a event organizer, but it came to myself because I had that idea. And so I'm trying to my best to organize the coolest event and mostly gather everyone. That's my main motivation, I guess. And gather everyone. If I if they go out from the event with a big smile, add a perfect i had my salary i would say yeah <laughs> yeah yeah totally dang man and uh yeah now it, the events are growing fast you know i have the feeling like i could like pretty much uh, end up my career and keep on going with the events but that's not the goal and um yeah for example this year we had three editions one in the pyrenees so at the border of spain and france in the south uh west of France, in that mountain range, in collab with Mathieu Capel. I'm not oh, a solo cool. guy, so we yeah. always collab for the new editions. Yeah. We had um, one in the French Alps, so in La Rosière, where it's, that, is, that edition is under my name, and it's over five days. And there's one more in Switzerland with Mathieu Cher. So, oh, cool. Yeah. So we had those three editions. And yeah, it was a lot of work. And right before coming here, uh we had those three editions and uh yeah it was intense but we trained more than 650 riders which is uh which is pretty cool just this year yeah just this year at the three events 650 yeah, three i know yeah. i was gonna i was curious i wanted to ask if you knew over the last seven years like how many people you've had come through oh uh, we calculate year by year but yeah uh, over the seven years i have no idea we had also one edition in pakistan no way. Yeah. Really? For yeah. the the Avalanche crew, did those guys get introduced to it? Oh, no, that was Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, yeah. Yeah, yeah my bad. Um, no, so, yeah. At one opportunity, we'll probably talk about it later to go to Pakistan. and Let's get into uh, it. What was it? Uh, right before COVID, I think it was 2000... No, 2020. 2020, some guides from Chamonix, Pika, that you know. Yeah. Really famous uh, guy from Chamonix. Insane free rider between alpinism and free riding, I would say. Yeah. If listeners, if you're not familiar with Pika, you should look him up. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. And uh, yeah, uh, I didn't really know him well, but he asked me to go on a trip to Pakistan with his nonprofit uh, organization called Zom Connection. Zom means uh, mountain. And um, the goal would be to collect gear. Uh, winter sport gear in the Alps and send it to Pakistan and then we would 
go get the gear in Pakistan and distribute it to the local communities because in Pakistan they have huge mountains. I've heard that. A lot of snow, but they have no idea about winter sports or, you know, they don't have the gear or anything. So the goal would be to go there and share our, our experience and kind of like open some free rental shops in some villages. And um, so that was a totally different trip, you know. Uh, after pretty much 10 years of video park shooting, you would go to a place and teach kids how to snowboard and distribute some gear every day. So it was a really cool trip. Also, why did they did that is that uh, so I was with a bunch of alpinists on that trip, including Pika. And Pika, the uh, year before, got injured in Pakistan because all the alpinists end up at some point in Pakistan uh, enjoying the country and taking a piece of that country. So they all did that trip to give back. And they all created that nonprofit to give back a bit to the country. After, I don't know, for some it was their 10th trip to Pakistan, you know, and it was the first first time they were really sharing with the community after, after that's awesome uh, all those trips so the non-profit is really cool and yeah we've been uh, to different places in uh in pakistan first one was madame jaba a tiny chairlift but it's the only ski resort in uh in pakistan well okay and that's where i met uh the afghanistan snowboard team because we we're in the same hotel and it was they had a, a small snowboard competition there which what was, was the course like? It was a Did you enter? dual slalom. Oh, sick. And a slalom. And a slalom. Yeah. Cool. Uh, they wanted us to in- enter the slalom. Okay. But uh, I didn't want to do the duel. It was like too hard. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like David against Goliath where you're like competing against... Uh, Different resources. Yeah. Between like, the two groups. Yeah. Yeah. When you're competing against uh, like your friend from Pakistan who haven't been riding much... Uh, Slope, yeah. actually, like yeah. You know, for some, it was the first time that they were snowboarding uh, on a, on a hard pack, you know, yeah. on a resort. Yeah, they would just hike mm-hmm. in the mountains uh, without any slopes, you know. Yeah, crazy. And then, so tell me, you know, this is kind of an interesting segue as well. Meeting the uh, the uh, yeah Afghanistan yeah, snowboard team. There is a lot of N at the end, but yeah. So um, on that trip. Uh, First, it was amazing, you know. We've been sharing so much with the locals and it was such a different trip, you know. What are you going to do tomorrow? Teach snowboarding in Pakistan. You know, for some of the girls, it was the first time they were allowed to practice a winter sport ever. So uh, before that, they weren't allowed. So, you know, I have some pictures with uh, like a crew of 10 little girls wearing dresses without any gloves, just... So and lit huge up. snowboards yeah, because we didn't smiles, have like, yeah. uh, they would like anyway be so stoked on snowboarding for their first time. And mm-hmm. It was a really good time. And anyway, on that trip, uh, for that competition, we were in the same hotel than the Afghanistan snowboard team, and uh, I had to hang out with them, same coach them a little bit, um, explain them how it was to be a pro snowboarder because they were really curious. It was the first time they would meet a pro snowboarder. And on my side, it was the first time I was meeting the official snowboard Afghanistan team. I was like, that wow. was legit. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. So I was, I was really curious and we started every night to after dinner to drink a tea and, and talk together. Hmm. And I created some some links with them you know i started a relationship and at the end I, at the end of those five days on in that resort i was like guys next year i'm coming to afghanistan to document your story because i think it's super cool that you're creating creating that team Do you know they were explaining to me that they didn't add any resort in afghanistan so okay. they would just hike around the no some passes yeah they have only 15 snowboard in the country that they would import from iran um, they would train on snowboard dunes in the summer. Whoa, okay. And uh, yeah, there are a team of like uh, 15 uh, men and, and women, super motivated and full of hope for snowboarding. And uh, I thought it was beautiful, so I decided to, yeah, let's go to Afghanistan with my friend Jerome probably. Yeah. Let's do a triplet episode there. Yeah, document. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's how I, we ended up 
creating links. And um, then the craziest story of my life uh, connected to snowboarding happened, where as we were organizing that trip, uh, I received a, one morning a call. It was August uh, 8th, 2021. I received that call from Afghanistan. Picked up the call. It was the director of the federation telling me, yo, Victor, Taliban came to the power. We received death threat letters. We are risking our life for being snowboarders and for supporting men and women equity. Man, you wanted to come to Afghanistan. It won't be possible, but please help us. It was 8 a.m. I was in bed with my lady. Dude. We're on vacation. <laughs> you're like, what the like, fuck? Talk about a clash of reality. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're like, whoa. You know, yeah. for me, you hear crazy news stories, right? I've never had a direct interaction with something on a real world scale yeah. like that. And that must have been that calls wild. And yeah, we all seen those images of people trying to, you know, grab the plane and falling from from the plane where while he was uh, flying and stuff. I don't know if you remember, but we we're all shocked by those images and I was like, wow, I need to help those friends, you know. There are snowboarders. Why they're risking their life because there are snowboarders like us and there's no way you got treated for for that, you know, in 2021. I started to do like I told him like I can't promise anything, but I will try my best, man. So starting different ways to it's a long story, but starting different ways to to help them. Honestly started to write posts on social medias or messages to social media on social medias to like embassies and stuff like that. But millions of Afghans were trying to leave at that time when the Taliban came to the power. So yeah. Uh, made the mistake to post on social media some photos of us riding the previous uh, winter in Pakistan saying, yo, my, my friend, I need help. Yeah. My friends are risking their life. Please help. And it was a mistake because I was posting their faces online showing that they were uh, snowboarders from Afghanistan. So from that mistake... We got pretty lucky and some people responded pos positively, especially two women from the States that never met those kids. Uh, we call them the two angels. And Jerome Tannon, the snowboard photographer, and Laurent Pordier, another snowboarder from France, uh, really involved in the Federation. And with those five, um, we, we succeeded, took a long long time for some but we gather a, a crew called the snowboarders of solidarity and created the non-profit and uh, we've been helping them to to flee the conflict flee their fly away there they were about to to die if we wouldn't do anything so um, we tried our best to gather money uh, to help them the first Eight of them uh, flew in the first flight, so we would find spots, you know, uh, mm -hmm. during that really sketchy time mm -hmm. when the uh, Taliban would control the airport before the U.S. Would, would leave the country. So the first eight got spread out all over the, the world. So some are in Canada, some are in the U.S., some are in um, Germany, etc., and um, they have been taken care of um, by the um, different governments. But for eight of them, they were stuck in the country when after the mm -hmm. U.S. Army left. They were stuck in the country and uh, we had to help them. And uh, we helped them to fly from Afghanistan to Pakistan, where they stayed for a year. We had to lodge and feed them. You have to understand that there were people like us. You know, yeah, they didn't want that situation. There were people like us, yeah, they're not full trying. of hope. <laughs> they just uh, want to shred. Snowboarders, <laughs> uh, you know, they were studying at university. They were died, you know, and they had money, they had everything, and they had, they had families, and they had to f 
Sleep. to leave everything behind because there was no other. No money, no more family, no more studies, nothing. So we had to take care of them in Pakistan where we had to lodge them, feed them for more than a year. Crazy, man. We were living in a kind of like a crazy movie because all the expeditions to like make them f fly from uh, Pakistan to Afghanistan, it was crazy. I definitely were in a, in a movie. Yeah, yeah, so many logistics. Yeah, and then while they were in Pakistan, we were trying to get any visas, you know, from any country. So we tried with Canada, we were pretty close, fell. And, you know, they stayed more than a year in Pakistan doing nothing, just waiting for me to get answers from government while I was uh, writing and, and trying to organize events and, you know, trying to live my best. Yeah. And they were just like, so Victor, do you have any news about... Any updates? Yeah. Any updates about the visas? I was like, man, I, I have no idea. So, but step by step, from a contact to another, I like to say that we created a rope, you know, mm. and we pulled them back uh, from their situation and uh, we succeeded one one day uh, they showed up and told me uh, yo Victor uh, I mean they called me and they told me yo Victor we received an email you succeeded we need to leave uh, Pakistan to France in the, le in the next 12 days <laughs> so okay Seven of my friends awesome. are coming to France. <laughs> I need to get flights, so money for flights, accommodation, uh, everything. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> and so I went with a, a van that my mother has, a nine-seat van, drove to Paris, went to pick them up at the airport, insane, with uh, Jerome, we went there. And uh, yeah, I became a... A father from zero to <laughs> seven child. <laughs> from zero to seven children in uh, one day. <laughs> he must be very proud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we brought them to the Eiffel Tower. We brought them climbing in Fontainebleau. And um, yeah, we found some accommodation for them. They asked for asylum. We found them some job. I'm sponsored by a burger mm -hmm. a restaurant company. And now they're working at those uh, at that spot, and yeah, we've been uh, snowboarding together. Now we are snowboarding a lot together. Every time I have a free spot in my in my car, I bring them. They go also by themselves to the resorts, and uh, then they learn how to speak French. They have asylum. They are dad, you know, and they are starting their new life uh, here Crazy. in France. Crazy, dude! That is so yeah. wild. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at, back at it, it's. Uh, I told that story like really shortly, but it's a really long one and with like so many details. But good fact is that uh, solidarity works, you know, with a bit of motivation, uh, it works. And Damn. that's what I get from the snowboard community and the mountain community in general. Thanks to that community, we help those kids. Yeah. And we helped uh, 15 of them. And now they are my brother, my children. And. Uh, we we are living a beautiful story. Dude, that's so wild. Yeah, it's just because it's not always, yeah, not always that kind of ending. And yeah, I think exactly. It, and it, well, it's interesting. It's like with that situation, or with an avalanche situation, or just plenty of things in life. But especially, I feel like we get this fast tracked uh, perspective in the mountains yeah. as to like how beautiful an experience can. Uh, become and then also how shitty that same experience can also become yeah, exactly. avalanches accidents you know yeah maybe you weren't able to get asylum for the guys it's that uh that perspective you know, is probably quite um some wild. of them were about to give up at some point some yeah. of them already called a cab to go back to afghanistan to help their families they were ready to risk their life to to go back to afghanistan and certainly we received an email saying like yo there's maybe a chance you will get a visa. So I tell them, no, don't leave. And two weeks after it worked out. Wild. It was insane. The story Dude. is like just insane. And it's the most 
insane story of just like life. a movie yeah for sure yeah, yeah uh, i mean compared to like what getting upset that you don't land a back seven on a yeah. cheese wedge that really <laughs> puts things getting upset that like some like local snaked your line it's really and, puts things in perspective of how fast things can change and man the emotion i got from that story like either like negative or positive at the end but you know are way way crazier than any tricks i stomped or any result i got on yeah on my snowboard, you know. Yeah. But it's still connected to snowboarding. Mm -hmm. And once again, thank you, snowboarding, for all those amazing yeah. emotions. It's a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, we're doing that. <laughs> no, but honestly, yeah, it worked out well. But it's a miracle for sure. Mm -hmm. That's so wild. I mean, dude, that kind of brings us up to like a bit more present day. I feel like you're still you're still sort of spinning all these hats like yeah how is it what's you know what what's your mindset going into a season this isn't something we've really talked about before but you seem quite methodical and um yeah like you think ahead about what you want and then you start planning on how to get there yeah how do you decide when do you start planning for a season and how do you kind of decide like this is where I'll put my energy. This is what I have to say no to. I'm a yes man. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. Honestly, I work full time all the time. I would take a few surf breaks or a few paragliding breaks, but I pretty much work all the time. And, and what I, does that look like? Because I think a lot of people think pro snowboarder and they, they assume you get in your car, get a nice little croissant, and go, <laughs> and go ride pow <laughs> and eat cheese at the end of the day then, with a little yeah, bit of wine yeah smack a couple slices of fromage <laughs> and then uh with a baguette <laughs> i take it first of all step by step at the beginning of my season uh, so first of all let's start in september uh we have all the movie premieres and stuff and we're at the same time we organize the event we release uh, the announcement for the events and stuff and then from November December on you're really focusing on the event organization you know like making sure that everything is down trying to trying to also to take a few breaks you know start snowboarding snowboarding is vacation compared to the events you know? <laughs> <laughs> beginning of the season I'm focused on the event till like mid January um, the goal is to gather everybody so they are ready at the beginning of the season. So mid-January, I hope they are trained and ready to ride some pal. Then, um, yeah, I'm starting to ride from mid-January on to end of uh, end of May usually. You know, I need a lot of time as uh, quite a lot to do this year at the Natural Selection Duel, which was also a pretty cool objective that came to me. And then, uh, yeah, the goal is to ride as much powder as possible, shoot the best tricks, and also make my different uh, web series happen. So I have a triplet, some adventure, eco-friendly snowboard fun series. Yeah, give us a quick uh, overview of yeah. triplet and, and the one that you have on the horizon. So, <laughs> you should watch the intro. My Look name up is Victor <laughs> He's also a host of a show. A host of a show. <laughs> so the goal, I'm spinning uh, three wheels. We would decide the adventure. One would be the destination. One would be the, the echo way of transportation. And the last one, but not least, the guest. The guest. <laughs> and depending on that, we make the adventure happen. So... We went to Corsica on a sailboat to surf and snowboard. We went with you, riding horses in Greece. Uh, I brought some locals in Pakistan on that trip I, I told you about uh, for their first backcountry experience with donkeys. Brought Aurélien Giraud, the famous uh, skateboarder, powder surfing in a lost chalet. Went uh, cycling in the UK with our snowboard between our legs to ride on dry slopes. And um, recently we went with an old car, Citroën Beaks, Millesim Edition, Champagne Color, <laughs> that works, that runs with a used VGO from that burger company, uh, to Norway with Machu Capel, and it was uh, pretty dope. 
Yes. So yeah, I'm having a lot of fun and crazy experiences through that series. Totally different from shooting video parts, and that's also what I like. You know, after 10 years shooting video part, I felt that, yeah, you like adventuring, you like backcountry. Why not uh, exper experiencing something new? And nobody kind of like took that direction also in snowboarding before. So I was just hyped to try something else. And But still, like, I'm a big fan of video parts and I want to shoot tricks, but also like having a it's bit like of fun. It's like a fun trip. Yeah. As I said, funnest trip I've been on. Yeah, honestly. So yeah. So I have that series and the other series... Uh, DVD videos where it's more some uh, either technical clips or artistic clips that I really enjoyed working on. We're going to be releasing the volume 10 wow, cool. next week, I guess. So it's going to be, a, yeah. that's also a series I really like. So trying to manage both, trying to plan all those trips ahead, you know, uh, I have some, some friends helping me also organizing the trips. And yeah, that's how I organized the season, you know, step by step, project by project. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Perfect. That's dope, dude. We're kind of, we're getting towards the end of our conversation yeah. here. You know, I think it'd be cool to change direction and maybe you could kind of just give us a run through of your backcountry kit. Backcountry like, kit? Yeah. Cool. What, do you, what do you like to run? You know, because I feel like you have some good... You got your, you know, your Yeti equipment, your Mammoth equipment, your Solomon yeah. equipment, all that stuff. Uh, let's start uh, by the top. <laughs> Helmet and goggles, shredding uh, spy optics. Yeah, they've been uh, doing pretty cool stuff. Then uh, we haven't talked about that, but I've also an uh, accessories company made in France that I started with my grandma called PAG. We just opened our own uh, workshop so we have like three seamstress making all our products made in France then uh, one year ago I got uh, on Artex super hyped on that uh, news you know it's an incredible brand with a really right crew behind the brand so I've been uh, shredding uh, their gear honestly best gear I've ever had ever so super stoked on, on the gear and uh, on being part of that team then uh, avalanche safety equipment. I've been uh, ripping mammoth gear. Yeah, you know, the Barry, Barry Vox. I think uh, that's uh, one of the best transceiver ever. It's so ever. good. You it's know, what I run too. I'm also. We haven't talked about that, but um, I'm. Um, I just passed my avalanche. Uh, how do you say that? Uh, avalanche instructor. Instructor. Yeah. Avalanche safety instructor. I think it's like Pro One is what's called in the US. Maybe. Yeah. So yeah, just we, a nice little another check in the box yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, we we made some tests recently and they they showed up like they were really good transceivers, probe and shovel, good quality, super important guys. Um, Arterix airbags are releasing a new airbag, mm, like an mm -hmm. electric one with a battery, mm -hmm. so you can put it up whenever you want, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Because I guess most of the people never test their airbags mm -hmm. before. Yeah, the Black Diamond, I think, also has, like, an inflated exactly. reflate system. And, yeah, the Jet Force is... I ran that before, and it's been really yeah, really nice to be able to, like, test it and then exactly. make, you know, put it away. Lesson Man, always in my pack. Yeah. Yeah, a good Lesson Man with a, a yeah, safety kit. Yeah, Lesson Man guy, totally. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. First aid kit, super important, too, with your Lesson Man. We, yeah. In the events, now we're promoting, you know, the gear is... Uh, transceiver, probe, shovel, first aid kit, if possible, an airbag backpack. Mm -hmm. so that's something really important. So always a first aid kit in the pack. And then uh, Salomon for almost 20 years. So boots, the Echo, hologram bindings, and uh, our board. Our board, the, the high pass. pass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because, yeah, guys, we've been uh, designing a board together, the mm -hmm. iPass, and it's uh, currently the, my favorite board. Yeah, it's super fun. I think um, kind of has that, like, directional vibe to it. And yeah. they use this recycled, upcycled base material as well that they put into the board to try and help reduce the footprint of it because, exactly. you know, trying to make any difference helps. So it's an awesome board. I've, I've enjoyed riding in it. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's my current kit, man. 
Cool. Yeah. I feel like you maybe forgot one other piece of your outfit, maybe a um, liquid courage of some sort that might be in your bag or at home at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. That's also, I think, involved with your grandmother. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Genepi. Genepi is a liqueur from the Alps. Hope you tried before. It's a mission every summer. I go just for fun. Go pick up some plants uh, in the mountains in some really scrambly rocks. So it's sketchy and fun to go pick it up. And then I make uh, that uh, liquor with my grandparents. And uh, we just make 50 bottles for friends and family. <laughs> and uh, every time we have a different artist making the label. So, yeah, it's a, just a fun side project that I really like. I've gotten one before. It's good. It's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, one more project, but that one is so much fun. Yeah. Dang, that's awesome, man. Well, solid kit, dude. Solid conversation. Really psyched. We just got to like sit down and catch up. I mean, we've been chatting a lot recently. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of just wanted to open up the floor to you to, again, share, promote any projects you have on the horizon you want people to see and um, toss out any thank yous of people you'd like to thank. Yeah, catch up on my YouTube channel to follow the different project. Uh, What's it called? Uh my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. Victor Davier, classic. Cool. But um, yeah, I hope you are going to be able to come at the Safety Shred Day one year. I'd like to. Yeah, yeah. that would be really cool. Check out our our brand pack. That would be really cool too. And yeah, enjoy powder riding, guys. That's the most important it's thing. Kind of a, yeah. The, and the thank key. yous. Wow, so many people to thank. Uh, starting by you, Nils. I think it was a really cool conversation today. Anytime, bro. Uh, thanks for the trip also. You know, it was fun to have the duo with you here. And thanks for inviting me to your home. And then after you, uh, wow, so many people have to thank my godmother and my mother for putting me on a snowboard because thank you, snowboarding. I had to live such a, an incredible life. You know, so many good moments shared on a snowboard or thanks to snowboarding. And uh, yeah, I'm going to stop after snowboarding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, snowboarding. That's cool. it. Cool. That covers a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Again, man, thank you. Really psyched we got to catch up. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And in the meantime, from the crew at Backcountry, we will see you out there. Mm -hmm.